which is so common uh, that you almost in every outpatient department um, you carry out in your hospital, you will find one such case in a busy OPD. These are the cysts and sinuses in the neck. And often they are congenital. And the only problem is that most of the times they are either not diagnosed or they are misdiagnosed for a long time. Just because the presentation or the manifestation of the illness, even if it is congenital, may not be right at birth. So there could be some individuals who would come in the middle age or in the young adult age and with these problems of the cysts. And the surgeon or the clinician doesn't think of these being of uh, origin because of congenital abnormality. So having said this, we will go one by one as to what are the different cysts and the sinuses. These are clubbed together as the branchial arch cysts uh, in most of the cases. Now, what are the branchial arches? These are the embryological precursors of the face, neck, and pharynx. You must have drawn that diagram many a times as to the face being developed from the two sides and with the foregut and then the five week old embryo. I'll go to that slide next. The anomalies, they are the second most common congenital lesions of the head and neck in children and anomalies of the second is the most common. So what is, what are the more commoner than the branchial large cysts? The more commoner things are the preauricular sinus and the thyroglossal cyst. The presentation of this uh, cyst arising from the branchial arches can be in the form of cyst or the sinus tract or a fistula or the cartilaginous remnant. You may find a tag just somewhere in the neck. And these are nothing but the branchial arch anomalies. Persistent cysts and the fistulae or the localized neck infections can also be there. Like many a times, suddenly a person will come, a child will come with a swelling in the neck, which is very tender. It has only got the history of only few days, maybe one or two days. And the surgeon or the clinician always thinks of, you know, lymphadenitis, acute lymphadenitis. In all these cases, which are of sudden origin, you should also think, besides the lymphadenitis part, that could it be an infected branchial cyst? Because the presentation will be almost similar. And unless the suspicion is there of the branchial cyst or the sinuses all the time, even in the uncommon positions, second arch is very simple. We will come to that, but it could be from the first, which is a little less common, or the third or the fourth or the sixth, which are still less common. And they will come with some very unusual presentations. And they will go from clinician to clinician to clinician to clinician without being diagnosed. And because nobody is suspecting that unusual thing, because the patient is not a, not a two-year-old or one-year-old child, he is, say, 13-year-old or 14-year-old boy. And you don't think of congenital that much at that time. But if you look into it, you will find that many of these lesions will be congenital. No pathognomic imaging features will diagnose. There is no pathognomic imaging feature. So 
it is all clinical. You supplement the radiology or the imaging just to see how much big it is or what is its relation. But you can never diagnose these cysts and sinuses from, you can diagnose this, that is a cyst and the sinuses, but you can't say that it's a branchial cyst or the sinus, branchial sinus purely on the image. It is more of a clinical suspicion that you should keep in mind. Surgical excision of the cyst or the tract is the most common curative option. So most of the time, you will be required to do surgery on these cases. And uh, uh, unless some reports are there of the sclerotherapy in some of the branchial cysts, but by and large, they would all require a surgical excision. Now, this is the diagram that you have grown drawing both at the school's level, then at the college level in the first professional, and then also as an ENT student, you must know this diagram by heart. There are very peculiar things in this diagram. And there are some, you know, very something, there, there are a few things which are very difficult to understand that why does it happen like that? So if you see on both the sides, these are the branchial arches, the first branchial arch, the second arch, the third arch, the fourth arch, fifth is rudimentary and the sixth arch. And then on the inner side, there are pouches and the outer side, there are clefts. So the first pouch between first arch and the second arch, there is a pouch. We'll come to what it forms later. Then second pouch, third and the fourth pouch and the fifth and the sixth, fifth pouch. So these are the, these are, these are the pouches and these on the other side is the cleft on the outer side. So one cleft, then all these clefts combined together here, same on this side. And you see there is a maxillary process. This first will be the, from the first will be the maxillary and the mandibular process. And if you, if you draw the diagram like this, then these are the maxillary and the mandibular process, and these are the branchial clefts, which you can see. So these are the clefts, and these are the pouches, depending on whether you are seeing from the outer side, ectodermal side, or you are seeing from the inner side. So if we are seeing from the ectodermal side, then these are the cleft. If you are seeing from the inner side, endodermal side, then these are the pouches. Now in the pouches, you will find that the third pouch, and this comes as the MCQ many times, that the inferior parathyroid gets its origin from the third pouch, whereas superior parathyroid gets its origin from the fourth pouch. Although logic would say that the inferior should be fourth and the superior should be third, but it is paradoxical that the inferior is from the third and the superior is from the fourth. And this comes as an MCQ sometimes in your entrance examination to the super specialities. Uh, the third pouch is the parathyroid gland inferior and the thymus you can see here and the paraform sinus comes from the third pouch. From the first pouch comes the auditory tube and then it expands inside and forms a tympanic cavity. And all the structures of that would be, logic would say, will be from this arch. Second pouch will give rise to palatine tonsil. And the second branchial arch will form the tonsillar fossa, will form the palatine tonsil, will form the stapes, uh, lesser horn of hyoid, muscles of the face expression and the floor of the mouth. The fourth branchial arch will give rise to intrinsic muscles of the soft palate, cricothyroid, laryngeal cartilages and the thyroid cartilage. The sixth arch will give rise to sternocleidomastoid trapezius, intrinsic muscles of the larynx and the laryngeal cartilages. Whereas the first branchial arch will form the 
form the mandibular prominence, the mandible, the incus, malleus, muscles of mastication, anterior diagnostic muscle, tensor tympani muscle, tensor villi palatinae muscle, mylohyoid, maxillary prominence, maxilla, zygomatic bone, squamous temporal bone, palatine bone, and the woma. So all these will come from the first arch. It is usually the, the, the problem of the second branchial arch that causes most of the sinuses in the fistulas uh, in the body. And the second is the first. So these are the derivatives of the branchial clefts and the pouches. And uh, we have already seen in the last diagram. And they are supplied by the different cranial nerves. Like the first will be deri derived, we will give rise, uh, will be supplied by the trigeminal. The second by the facial. The third with the glossopharyngeal. The fourth with the vagus superior laryngeal nerve. And the sixth with the vagus recurrent laryngeal nerve. And the arterial supply will also be different. The first will be with the maxillary artery. Second with the stapedial artery or the higher artery. Third, with the carot common carotid and third carotid artery. Fourth, with the right proximal subclavian artery or the left aortic arch. And the sixth, with the right, on the right side, proximal pulmonary artery and the left side, proximal pulmonary artery and ductus arteriosus. So you must remember the artery, the nerves, and the structures coming out of it. And uh, what are the different arches? Uh, they are called... Sometimes the branchial arches are also called pharyngeal arches. Arch is an arch, you know, they may call branchial arch or the pharyngeal arch, but it's an arch. So arch, cleft, and pouch. These are the main terminologies. Branchial or pharyngeal vary from person to person. They, they write differently. So don't get confused by the pharyngeal, pharyngeal arch and the branchial arch. It is synonymous. So the branchial arch and anomalies are bilateral in two to three percent of cases. Like in two to three percent of cases, you will find two sinuses opening in the neck, in the at usually at the junction of upper uh, lower one third and upper two third sternocleidomastoid anterior border. A very famous photograph given in your Love and Bailey, where the lady is wearing a green uh, overcoat and um, showing the two arches, uh, two, two sinuses here, and um, uh, it is labeled as branchial sinus. So that forms a very important question because it's the diagram is given in one of the very famous book. A branchial sinus is a blind branchial cleft sinus or the branchial sinus pouch sinus. So it's a blind thing. Uh, Whereas the fistula will not be blind as you, as any other part of the body. So acrodermal lining and the endodermal lining meeting together and forming the fistula will be the fistula's tract. So the fistula will be complete, uh, whereas the sinus will be usually the, the cleft part will form the sinus, only the cleft. Whereas if the pouch part is also involved on that side, then it becomes the fistula. If no communication occurs with the inner mucosa or the outer skin, then the trapped branchial arch remnant forms the cyst. The cyst may not have any, any sinus or any uh, inner opening or an outer opening on the skin or inside the body, body cavity. And it will be just a cyst. It is possible. It can have a, uh, it can have the opening also, but usually it may not have any opening and it will not be discharging. They result from incomplete obliteration of the branchial apparatus, the cyst, and primarily the cleft. So they form from the incomplete obliteration of the cleft. In sinuses and fistulae, the pharyngeal membranes and the pouch are also implicated. So, if I have to draw the
the different cysts and the sinuses where they are. Then the first will be here, which is less common. Most of the com most common sinuses, cysts, fistulae, everything occurs in this part of the neck. From starting not just at the sternoclavicular level, little above it, little above it, say, say most of the lower one third of the sternocleo mastoid is left above that and going up onto the neck in the anterior part. And they are all in the anterior part of the neck. Now, what is the anterior part of the neck? So most of the time, this question is asked, is the branchial cyst, second branchial cyst, an anterior neck swelling? Or is it a midline swelling? Many a times it is. And most of the time it is because it is between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid. Anything between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid is the anterior neck or the midline neck. Midline neck doesn't mean midline, midline. Midline means between the two sternocleidomastoid. Lateral neck swellings, lateral to the sternocleidomastoid. Medial to the sternocleidomastoid, to sternocleidomastoid, all are midline swelling, all are midline sinuses, all are midline things. So many times people are confused as to thyroid swellings, even if it is on one side, even if it is left lobe or the right lobe of the thyroid, it is a midline swelling of the neck. So it doesn't become a lateral swelling of the neck. It remains the midline because it, it is between the two sternocleidomastoid. So most common second arch. Uh, swellings are here and uh, they inside if they have to open uh, if it is a sign if it is a fistula then there will be a there, there, there will be an opening here and there will be opening in the tonsillar fossa if it is just a sinus there will be opening here if it is a cyst there will be cyst here second common is this parotid part this is the first rank here opening inside maybe in the external auditory canal, outside opening in the submandibular area. So this part from the submandibular area to the external auditory canal, all these things is the first branchial arch. The third branchial fistula is just at the sternoclavicular level, just at the sternoclavicular level. And this is the lower part, lowermost part. They are not that common. They will be just at the sternoclavicular level, not above. The second one will be little above, will not be at sternoclavicular level. It will be little above. Whereas third branchial fistula will be at sternoclavicular level. So that's how you differentiate between the second and the third. Second is very common. 95% of the cases of the of the cysts of sinuses of the branchial genico region in the neck will be second arch. Few will be first arch, and a third, fourth, and sixth will be less. The third, the opening will be in the piriform sinus. The first, the inner opening will be in the external aortic canal. So the third, from here, here to the piriform sinus, so it travel travels quite a lot here till the piriform sinus. Piriform sinus will be at this level. So. Till the prior form signs. This opening inside will be tonsillar fossa. This also quite a long one from here to the tonsillar fossa. And you can imagine if it, the track is that long and it is, it is a fistula and it is going from here to there in, in the neck, from the neck into the tonsillar fossa, which structure it can injure, I mean, if, if the surgeon can injure while removing it. So the first and the foremost and the most common injury which is happening while removing the branchiogenic cyst, the second arch cyst, is injury to the hypoglossal nerve. Not only because it goes around the hypoglossal nerve, but also there is extra bleeding at the hypoglossal nerve site. There are hypoglossal vessels near the where it turns in the neck in and uh, the vessels 
So in any neck dissection, when these vessels bleed, you try to coagulate. And in, ad, in that, while doing that, inadvertently, you will injure the hypoglossal nerve. So the injury and also while removing the, the if you are not careful and very careless, you may cut the hypoglossal nerve thinking that it is just a fibrous band. So the hypoglossal nerve injury is the most common injury which is encountered in removal of the branchial sinuses and the fistulas. And you have to be careful about just one thing, and that is the hypoglossal nerve. Rest of the things will be very, very, very obvious. External carotid artery and the branches, you will not injure because you will know they will be beating, they will be uh, pulsatile. So you, 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 will, you will know that uh, this is an artery and you will be able to trace. God has written over external carotid artery that it's an external carotid artery. What has he written? He has given the branches to the external carotid artery. So it's written there that this is external carotid artery. You don't have to remember that it is lateral and the anterior and things like that as compared to internal carotid artery. It's written there. Internal carotid artery without branches. External carotid artery with the branches. So the the fish sinus tract will pass through, through that, but you will not usually injure them because that part is, is very obvious. The only thing which is injured is the hypoglossal and the superior laryngeal vessels and the nerves. Superior laryngeal vessels and the nerves, again, if you are not careful, you will injure. So uh, that, that is one thing that one has to remember. Branchial cysts are lined by the squamous epithelium. Immediately outside, which lies, are the abundant lymphoid tissue. Like uh, there will be branchial cyst, and outside will be abundant lymphoid tissue. And this is picked up with the MRI and the CT scan also, the abundant lymphoid tissue. Etiology of the branchial cyst is not, com not clear, but uh, it is thought that it is the anomaly of the branchial apparatus or it is from the lymphoid tissue. Some people say that it is not the branchial apparatus which is at fault. It is the lymphoid tissue which is around is at fault. Anyhow, uh, but it is a branchogenic in origin and it's branchial cyst. So the branchial cyst number two, the second branchial arch anomaly. The branchial arch number two, the second branchial arch, the anomaly of these forms the most of the branchial cyst. And this is the location of that branchial cyst all the time. What can you confuse with? There are only two structures that you can confuse with. One, the lymph node. Second, the, carot the carotid bulb. So carotid body tumor or the lymph node, a large lymph node. These are only two possible diagnoses that would hit your mind when you think of the branchial cyst number two. Uh, arising from the number, number two arch. So, uh, but clinically it will be different. Clinically it will be, it will be, if it is not infected, it will be, it will be compressible. It will be, uh, you, uh, you will be able to elicit the thrill in it, but uh, or, uh, it will be manually, you will be able to, uh, it will fluctuate. Uh, so, but when it becomes infected and the patient comes in the acute stage, then all these features may disappear and it will be very hard and tender. And uh, it will be very difficult to differentiate it from a lymph node. But uh, you can uh, 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 do the ultrasound. Uh, these days, ultrasounds um, in some of the centers are available on the with, 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 with the surgeon. And... Uh, even in the examination table, uh, uh, the ultrasound machine is uh, fitted. Uh, so as to, it has become more of a, ultrasound has become more of a examination tool than an investigative tool. Uh, um, and it is not only for the surgeons, uh, who uh, we as an ENTs would be interested in cyst, sinuses and the thyroid for the ultrasound. Uh, but, uh, Yes, um, uh, e even uh, I was very surprised when the, I came to know, uh, know that the ultrasound is also very useful 
in seeing the vocal cord vibration. So you can do the ultrasound and diagnose the bilateral vocal cord palsy or the unilateral vocal cord palsy. But that is taking it to some other level. Uh, ultrasounds are very useful tool for the ENTs in diagnosing the cyst and in diagnosing the, th in evaluating the thyroid gland. So in this, the ultrasound, if you have on the table uh, in your clinic room, uh, it will just diagnose. But if it is not there, then you will send it. And um, these are the round fluctuant swellings. Upper part, upper neck, anterior to the sternocleidomastoid, always anterior to the sternocleidomastoid. So anterior to the sternocleidomastoid makes it an anterior neck swelling. And be between the two sternocleidomastoid, whatever is there is the midline. Excision of it will be, is possible. And um, is the only answer uh, usually for the branchial cyst. Although there are reports that uh, some sclerosing therapy People have tried in the branchial cyst and have, they have uh, sclerosed the branchial cyst. But uh, book, uh, if you go by book, uh, the, the treatment for any branchial cyst would be excision. So you can do the fistulogram in such cases if it is a fistula or a sinus in, in, at this level. And um, uh, you can do the CT scan and you can see CT scan is not pathognomic. CT scan will just tell you the cyst part. CT scan will at the most tell you that there is some debris inside. And, um, you know, uh, that debris is because of the infection and uh, because of the inflammation, there, there could be some debris inside. But CT scan, by, just by looking at it, you can't say that this is a bran 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 bronchogenic cyst, branchial cyst. So that is not possible. But, uh, yeah, by the location and things like that, you can say but there is no characteristic feature of a branchial cyst in the CT scan. And when you remove, you can see that this is the cyst and its relation to the hypoglossal nerve. This was the hypoglossal nerve that we were talking about. And you can just understand that if you put the cyst back into this position, it is just adjacent, in fact, lying over from here to here, onto the hypoglossal nerve. So you can injure the hypoglossal nerve. You can injure the ansa hypoglossi. You, you can injure the internal carotid artery or the branches, the external carotid artery or the interjugular vein also. But usually they are not injured because you know about it. The only th structure which is inadvertently in many of the cases is injured is the hypoglossal nerve because there are a lot of vessels around here. And you you tend to cauterize them with the bipolar or the unipolar cautery. And at that point, when you're cauterizing this, this over this nerve, that the nerve gets damaged. So the prank, second branchial cleft anomalies are the most common and they present as cysts followed by sinuses and the fistula. So most of them will be the cysts and then few will be the sinuses and some will be the fistula. So, so the, Site will be most within the submandibular space, but they can occur anywhere along the course of the second branchial arch track, which extends from the skin overlying the supraclavicular fossa, as we saw, little above the supraclavicular fossa, not at the, not at the sternoclavicular joint, but just above the overlying the supraclavicular fossa between the internal and external carotid arteries to enter the pharynx at the level of tonsillar fossa. So from there, uh, the, the track goes up to the tonsillar fossa. This name comes very often into the MCQs and uh, is asked is about the Bailey, Bailey's classification. Bailey was in 1929, as early as 1929, described second branchial cleft anomalies. Type 1, most superficial, lies along the anterior surface of the sternocleidomastoid deep to the platysma, but not in contact with the carotid sheath. Type 2, most common type, lies anterior to the sternocleidomastoid, posterior to the submandibular gland, as you could see in that patient, and adjacent and lateral to the carotid sheath. So we go back to this again, this diagram again. So it is anterior to the sternocleidomastoid, posterior to the submandibular gland, anterior to the sternocleidomastoid, posterior to the submandibular gland, 
anterior to the sternocleidomastoid. Here will be, would be the sternocleidomastoid. It is retracted. Posterior to the submandibular gland, the submandibular gland would be somewhere here. So it is just turned there. So it's looking like that. And adjacent to the carotid sheath, as you could see there, adjacent to the carotid sheath and its structure. Type 3 extends medially between the bifurcation of the internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery, lateral to the pharyngeal wall. And type 4 lies deep to the carotid sheath within the pharyngeal mucosa's, mucosal space and opens into the pharynx. So it is the second type. In type 2 also, the second type is the most common. So type 2, most common is, which lies anterior to the sternocleidomastoid, posterior to the submandibular gland, and adjacent to, adjacent and lateral to the carotid sheath. A fistula or the cyst. In the lower or the anterior, uh, lower anterior or the lateral to the neck, uh, if it is there, lower part of the neck, but not at the sternoclavicular joint, little above that would be a second branchial cyst or uh, uh, sinus or the fistula. Fistula usually present in infancy or the childhood, not later. Uh, the cysts can come much later. A young adults can come with the cyst. Even adults, even the middle aged have seen cysts presenting at the at at that that age, uh, not in the not in the early part of the life. So it can manifest any time. But the fistula and the sinus is usually present in the infancy and the childhood, and with the secretions coming out of that, and the child is always bothered. Uh, just at the collar side, the, the secretions will be coming. Sometimes one side, and if Rarely, in 2% of cases, both sides uh, uh, are the anterior border sternocleidomastoid must start within the lower third of the neck. Cysts, when they are there, they are painless, compressible, lateral uh, neck, but, uh, but, but, but anterior neck. Lateral part of the neck, but anterior neck. Lateral part of the anterior neck. Uh, still would be... Uh, classified as the midline swelling, right? Tender or and or increases in size if infected. Histologically, they are filled with the turbid yellow fluid containing cholesterol crystals and lined by stratified squamous epithelium. So this is the common uh, site of the sinus or the fistula on one side of the neck. Here, you can see it on both the sides of the neck. And this is the small child presenting on both the sides. Such say, sinus and fistula are, uh, are in 2% of the cases of the total second branchial cleft or the sinus or the cyst abnormalities. Differential diagnosis in adults is the lymph node. It could be infective lymph node or it could be metastatic lymph node. So if it is a metastatic lymph node, it could be a one of the DD. It would require MRI and a PET CT and the pri um, prior to uh, pen endoscopy and the tissue biopsy. So always we do uh, the PET CT or the MRI first, then the tissue biopsy or the biopsy because it changes the uh, radiology of the of the lymph node or any structure from where the biopsy is taken. Differential diagnosis in children is occult primary thyroid cancer. Though rare, but you must uh, you must know that occult uh, sorry not primary occult papillary thyroid cancer. Occult papillary thyroid cancer is one of the common uh, um, uh, one of the uh, uh, cancers which can occur in children. And uh, so there are two ages in which it occurs. So in, you must always be looking, um, having an, uh, a, a needle of suspicion when you uh, come across uh, uh, such things that uh, am I dealing with occult papillary thyroid cancer is also a recognized cause of cystic metastasis and may occur, may be seen in children. Fluid aspiration is the only way that to diagnose it and uh, to say, 
that um, this is uh, uh, maybe thyroid um, uh, thyroid uh, arising from the thyroid. And if you can find thyroglobulin there, thyroglobulin anywhere means related to the thyroid. So thyroglobulin, if you find um, in the aspiration, then it is from the thyroid. So ultrasound is um, is commonly done and it will show you the well circumscribed, thin walled, uh, anechoic with evidence of compressibility and posterior acoustic enhancement and internal echoes compatible with the internal debris. So this will be the most common finding and most commonly done. CT imaging can be done, MRI can be done. On T1 weighted, it will be low or maybe a high signal depending on what is the con consistency of the of the fluid inside. But T2 weighted will be always hyper intense. It will be just glowing white. Uh, sometimes you may find the tissue weak between the internal and external carotid artery um, as a finding in the type three cysts uh, of, um, uh, of the second branchial um, cysts. Uh, surgical management involves complete surgical excision, encompass, encompassing the external sinus opening and the dissection of the sinus tract also. Then comes the first branchial cleft anomalies. The first branchial arch tract extends from the cutaneous opening in the submandibular triangle, as we saw, superior lateral to the hyoid bone, starting superior lateral to the hyoid bone. So that means if something is superior lateral to the hyoid bone, then most of the submandibular gland is finished by that level. So, so submandibular triangle, most of it is finished. Posterior part is remaining. So cutaneous opening in the say the posterior part of the of the submandibular triangle, then superior lateral to the hyoid bone, ascending to the region of the parotid to terminate in the bony and the uh, bony junction. Uh, Cartilage is the bony junction of the external aortic canal. So it goes like this from here at the higher level uh, behind the higher to the um, junction of the external and uh, external aortic canal, bony and the cartilage junction. So anything which travels here will be traveling around the seventh nerve. So excision of it puts the seventh nerve at risk. Excision of second branchial cysts and the fistulas puts hypoglossal nerve at risk. Excision of the first uh, sinus and the fistula puts seventh cranial nerve at risk. So these are some of the MCQs which come. Presentation, pit-like depression at the angle of the mandible. If infected, purulent discharge and associated adenitis in the submandibular area, inflammatory mass in the parotid region, and the drainage of mucus or the pus from the external artery canal. So, you, so all the time, if there is a swelling here in the neck, just at the parotid region or, or in the submandibular region, um, and there is a discharge from the external artery canal, also think of first branchial arch cyst or the sinus. Uh, or the fistula. So think of that, uh, it, that it could be a, a sinus which is opening in the, in that location in the external artery canal, which has got this attached cyst, and maybe it is a fistula communicating down uh, into the inside also. CT imaging will show the cystic mass superficial within or deep to the parotid cerebral gland. Surgical excision utilizes superficial parotidectomy approach, the same approach as you do for the superficial parotidectomy with potential risk of the injury to the facial nerve. So you will use the facial nerve monitor always while removing the first branchial arch cyst. So this is the location of the cyst, uh, of the first branchial arch cyst location, either this, uh, very close to the external artery canal there and um, uh, on the medial aspect here onto the uh, uh, sitting just anterior to the uh, just sitting just anterior to the mastoid and or 
little lower uh, behind the submandibular gland uh, in the in the uh, and the parotid gland. The third and the fourth branchial arch uh, uh, cleft anomalies appear similar to the second branchial cleft anomalies externally with the cutaneous opening just at the supraclavicular area, just at the sternoclavicular joint and or in the supraclavicular area. So it is much lower. And uh, however, internally they enter pharynx through the piriform sinus below the hired bone. Most third branchial cleft cysts present in posterior cervical space posterior to the sternocleidomastoid. So these are lateral neck swellings or net or, or, or they, they are opening up with the with the uh, lateral lateral neck swellings. A fourth branchial cleft spatula or the sinus tract arises from the piriform sinus apex and descends inferiorly to the mediastinum in the path of tracheoesophageal groove. They are commonly left sided. So these are the first branchial cleft anomalies, and uh, they have to be diagnosed, differentially diagnosed. First branchial anomalies are differentially diagnosed with parotitis uh, or the abscess in the parotid region, lymphatic malformation, parotid silocele, or the benign lymphoepithelial cyst. Second branchial cleft anomalies are differentially diagnosed with the lymphatic malformation, cystic nodal metastasis, lymphadenopathy, or the schwannoma. The third branchial cleft anomalies are differentially diagnosed with the lymphatic malformation or the abscess, cervical thymic cyst, intrahyoid thyroglossal duct cyst, or the cystic nodal metastasis, or the laryngocele. And the fourth branchial cleft anomalies can be differentially diagnosed with the cervical thymic cyst, lymphatic malformation, or the thyroglossal duct cyst. So you should remember all these DDs uh, while you are dealing with the cysts and the sinuses in these regions. So branchial sinus excision has got the relation to the internal and external carotid artery, and it has got the relation with the hypoglossal nerve when we are talking about the second branchial, uh, branchial sinus cyst. First branchial sinus cyst uh, with the relation to the seventh nerve. Now we come to another entity is called the cystic hygroma, which is commonly seen in children. Um, and this is nothing but the lymphangioma. It is multilocular. It is soft cystic, partially compressible, and it is highly transluminant. Uh, it is usually there in the posterior triangle and infancy or the early childhood, they will be presenting very early in life. They are, they are treated with the excision or some sclerotherapy, and I usually use bleomycin. And in, in that, we have got uh, a case series of patients being treated of lymphangioma and the, and the uh, cystic hygroma with the bleomycin. Uh, we'll, we'll show you some of the pictures of the cystic hygroma and the lymphangioma later, but the next common cyst, and in fact, the most, more, much more commoner than the branchial cyst is the thyroglossal cyst and the sinus. And sometimes it is described as the most common cyst and the sinus is in the neck. But more than that is a preauricular sinus. As much as 2% of your classmates, if it's a class of 100, two students would be having a preauricular sinus. Uh, thyroglossal cyst is also common but not that common, but it's commoner than the branchial cyst. This is the midline in the upper part of the neck, but anywhere in the course of the thyroglossal duct, it can occur. So we should know what is the thyroglossal duct um, uh, course, which will be there in the next slide. Form, they are formed at the level of hyoid, and uh, they are not sort of fluctuant. There will be nodular, there will be hard because the fluid is in a very small space and it is tense, so they will be firm. Uh, and we all know it moves with the protrusion of the tongue. That's how you differentiate it from the thyroid swelling, which doesn't move with the protrusion of the tongue, but moves with the deglutition. It moves with protrusion of the tongue. May contain only functional thyroid, and that has to be always, the suspicion 
should always be there. That is there any clinical evidence which tells you that this could be the only thyroid? Because if you remove that, then you have to supplement the patient with the thyroid um, hormones all throughout his life. You have to give thyroxin. And the operation to be done is cyst trunks. We come to the cyst trunks operation. So the histopathology, it is lined by the respiratory epithelium, the squamous epithelium, or a combination of both. Due to high frequency of infection, inflammatory infiltrates can be present. These can appear as the granulation or the giant cells on the histopathology. And in about 70% of the cases, microscopic foci of the ectopic thyroid gland tissue will be found on the histopathology. So if you do the final respiration cytology or you send patients uh, thyroglossal cyst for, uh, for, for the histopathology, there will be microscopic foci of the ectopic thyroid gland. Evaluation is done with the imaging to both diagnose and evaluate for the presence of the healthy thyroid tissue, you can do the imaging. If normal thyroid tissue is in the inferior neck is absent, um, then it should raise the suspicion that, that it, uh, is it the only thyroid tissue which is there uh, in, in the cyst. So if you, if you do the ultrasound or if you do the CT scan and you do not find the normal thyroid gland, then you must counsel the patient that there is a possibility that when you remove the cyst, uh, all the thyroid tissue would have gone and uh, the patient will be put on the thyroid supplement throughout his life. So imaging is not only for the diagnosing the thyroid cyst or the thyroglossal cyst, it is also to see the normal thyroid tissue, whether it is there in place or not. Same will be true when you do the surgeries on the lingual thyroid. When you, when you are doing the radiology, it is not the lingual thyroid radiology that is important. It's a normal thyroid radiology which is important that you see that the thyroid is in place. And it is if it is in place, then in all probabilities, it is functional. So, But if you do not find the thyroid in place and it's a lingual thyroid, then before touching that patient, you will counsel him that uh, um, any treatment of the lingual thyroid will lead to, can lead to, the thyroid supplementation which would be required throughout his life. Ultrasound is the ideal initial imaging choice. It does not require ionizing radiation or sedation, which is important in treating these children. So the ultrasound can be done. CT and MRI is not required, but ultrasound should be done. Management is surgical removal. But if you remove, just give an incision and remove the cyst, it is possible to remove the cyst. And you'll be very happy that you have done the nice job and it will be out within a few minutes uh, as any other cyst. Uh, like if it is a, just a dermoid, it can be removed like that. But if you remove the thyroglossal cyst like that, then there is a 50% chance that it will recur. So don't remove like that and do the cistern operation. So cistern operation entails that you first cover from, uh, um, uh, from the um, uh, from the base of the tongue and involve the middle third of the thyroid uh, of the higher bone, remove that, and also uh, not be very close to the thyroglossal duct. Not very close, but have the tough of tissue between, uh, in between. So all, all around the thyroglossal uh, duct. So if you find that fistula tract or the sinus tract, uh, of the thyroglossal cyst or the thyroglossal fistula, then have the cuff of tissue around. Don't be very close. Don't, don't, uh, um, if you have injected, some people do inject methylene blue. If you have injected, then don't be very close to that methylene blue thing, that you are very close to it and that, that's it. No, you have to have the cuff of tissue around that because there will be a lot of tentacles going here and there along the, the, that uh, track, which would, which would amount to, which will give rise to recurrence. So you have to take a cuff of tissue around and not be very close and take it from the central third of the hired bone, uh, also some tissue. Uh, if you remove the central third of the hired bone, fine. Some people do not remove the central, border of the uh, central third of the hired bone, but they dissect it very carefully around the hired bone. 
they go posterior to the hyoid bone, dissect it very carefully, come anterior, and see to it that it is just bare bone left there. Uh, I do like that. And, um, but you have to be very, very careful and sure that you do not, and if you find the fissurous tract going through the hyoid bone, then definitely you will have to cut. But if you do not find the fissurous tract going through the hyoid bone, then you may not cut it, uh, but, but you must make it so bare that you can palpate the bone and um, make it bare. And you should never do this surgery in the acute infection. So this is the uh, way in which the thyroid gland descends and the thyroglossal duct is there. So from the core of the base of the tongue, from here, uh, uh, the, the foramen cecum, it goes down in the posterior one third of the tongue, uh, turns around the hyoid bone, goes posterior to the hyoid bone, this is the body of the hyoid, and then turns down. So when you are removing, either remove the hyoid bone or at least do the dissection so well that it doesn't recur here. So this is the very typical uh, picture of a thyroglossal cyst in a small child, and this will move on protrusion of the tongue. And these are the sinuses or the fissures which occur because of the thyroglossal duct. And these, this is a midline structure. Thyroglossal, but but you find that the fistula or the sinus tract, this is not midline here. It is away from the midline. So it is little away from the actual midline midline, but it is still the midline structure of the neck, and it will be a midline fistula. It will be called at midline fistula of the neck uh, because it is between the two sternocleidomastoids. So this is the cistrunk operation and the specimen out, and you can see that uh, fistula tract is taken out with a cuff of uh, with, with a little bit of skin also and the sinus opening here and the cuff of tissue is not just the duct it is there is there, there is uh, there is not only it is it is not only that the duct is removed it is the duct along with the peri peri uh, periductal cuff of tissue which is removed because it can also contain some tentacles of the of the uh, fistula tract. So this is the cystic hygroma and uh, a child um, um, uh, with a cystic hygroma uh, who couldn't present. And uh, this is a cystic hygroma, uh, again, a lymphangioma and um, uh, pre-injection pre, pre, um, or pre-sclerotherapy, uh, this would be the lymphangioma look like. And if you see the CT scan, uh, it would look like this. And uh, we usually give as a first line management, the bleomycin sclerotherapy. And uh, we have got a large series of the bleomycin sclerotherapy. Uh, it is given in the form of one milligram per kilogram body weight and one milligram per ml in large and two ml, milligram per ml in a small. This is the concentration that we use. Uh, first injection, two milligram initially, and wait for one hour before injecting the full. Uh, use a 23 gauge needle, one to four sites, up to five injections you can give. Uh, usually two to three injections, maximum of less than six milligram per kilogram uh, total dose, because um, there is a, there is a fear that it could cause uh, some fibrosis and your the dreaded pulmonary fibrosis, though it doesn't occur. But um, yeah, that is a fear. Uh, two to three weeks interval, uh, these can be repeated. And sometimes it is done in the ultrasonic guidance uh, and not blindly. So this is how you inject. And this is the pre three weeks after the first injection. And this is three weeks after the second injection, the sole swelling is completely disappeared. And uh, good that we did not operate on this child and uh, it could just be, uh, you know, just removed uh, with this. This also has been treated with the, uh, this is the pre and the post sclerotherapy, but this was a vascular malformation, low uh, flow uh, vascular malformation. And we have got some vascular malformations also being uh, injected with the bleomycin and they have done very well. So uh, uh, 
that is one uh, one of the good cases of the vascular malformation also being treated with the bleomycin. So the other sclerotherapic agents which can be given are the hypertonic saline, which we used to be tried earlier, or the boiling water, or the OK-432, which is a, a Japanese drug, or block, or doxycycline, or a 50% dextrose, and we use the blemycin. Uh, the classification of hemangiomas and lymphangiomas, as you know, are the hemangiomas can be classified as a capillary hemangioma, commander's hemangioma, or the mixed hemangiomas. And the lymphangiomas can be classified as lymphangioma simplex, cavernous lymphangioma, or the cystic hygroma. When the cysts are very big, then the cystic hygroma. Cystic hygromas, the larger is the cyst size, the e easier it will be to tackle with the with the sclerotherapy. The smaller are the uh, are uh, uh, the uh, cyst sizes, then it may be difficult. So larger cyst sizes, you can inject more, and they will just collapse. And um, you can withdraw some fluid, and uh, whatever remains, you can inject the bleomycin, and it will just disappear. So, this is one person in which we, uh, we injected. And um, this fellow is, uh, uh, when he came to me, he was a 10th class student, and now he's, uh, he's an engineer in the United States. And uh, so, uh, this was the cystic swelling that he came up with, and uh, we did this. And you can see it just completely disappeared. The swelling has completely disappeared with the sclerotherapy. And the sclerotherapy used in our cases has always been bleomycin. This is another case in which uh, the sclerotherapy has been given. And these are the different cases in which we have tried the sclerotherapies. Sometimes it is not possible to remove, uh, to completely um, uh, sclerose the whole thing. But see, this, this is pre-sclerotherapy. And this is post sclerotherapy. Anybody would say that uh, a surgeon would prefer this over this uh, for removal. So if it becomes even this size and um, you have to operate, it will be much easier. See, if the lax skin easy, it will be to dissect out uh, this, this child rather than this child in which there will be a lot of infection and a lot of bleeding. And um, um, uh, so one would like it to reach this stage and then you can do the surgery. And same is true uh, in this case in which uh, we have given the bleomycin. Uh, this is our presentation and this is our uh, article in uh, Pediatric Otolaryngology International uh, of the bleomycin. This is the most, uh, one of the very common uh, uh, abnormalities. And uh, as I told you, 2% of your batchmates would be having this preauricular sinus most of them on both the sides and uh, sometimes it gets infected it is because of uh, the uh, this first and the second placard from which the helix arises do not meet completely and this is a sinus and it gets infected uh, you will not operate when it is infected but you will operate when it is not infected and uh, that is the treatment in uh, but many of them remain silent throughout the life and you don't have to operate any time and uh, they do well. Uh, the thymic cyst, uh, thymus develops from the third pharyngeal pouch and then descends through the neck to the mediastinum. Remnants may persist along the path as cyst or the solid, it's, and they require excision. The sublingual dermoid, as you can see in the photographs, is, uh, um, is also not uh, very uncommonly seen. Sometimes you come across this. It is beneath the tongue and can extend below uh, down to the higher may be filled with the keratin and it requires just the excision. And the midline dermoids, these are very common and they are always um, confused with the thyroglossal cyst, do not move, but they do not move with the protrusion of the tongue. And uh, these can be, usually they are submental and they require excision. So thank you very much for uh, kind listening. If there are any question, I will be very happy to answer. Sir, this is uh, Nilima, this side. Uh, thank you, sir, right. for the excellent uh, talk, sir, and the um, uh, images which uh, sh showed the pre and post injection results. Uh, they were excellent results. Uh,
uh, I think uh, many MCQs and short answer questions do come from this uh, uh, this area, and uh, the yeah. participants would definitely benefit uh, from this uh, talk. Uh, in the chat box, I presently I don't see any uh, questions. I, even, I I do not see any question there, except for the good evening, sir. <laughs> so, <laughs> what is the first uh, line of diagnosis? Uh, that is one question. First line of first line diagnosis. I'm not able to make out what this doctor wants to know. The uh, what fissure. is the first line diagnosis for her? I think she must be meaning swelling neck. Yes. So the I think they are they, they are asking about the first branchial arch fistula probably, um, and. Um, uh, Second branchial arch present at around 32. Yes, the second branchial arch says can present at around 30 to 32 years old adult. Yes, they can. Um, they, they manifest first time um, at that age. It can happen. It can happen quite late in life. So that is possible. First line investigation in the midline swelling of the neck. Midline swelling, old patient. First line, so first, first line investigation is always uh, 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 ultrasound and um, b uh, these days uh, the uh, it is not uh, no more it's an investigation it's a part of examination sort of a thing but first line investigation in any midline swelling of the neck would remain the ultrasound so what is the role of fnac in swelling in the submandibular region yes fnac of course but uh, usually in the branchial cysts you um, uh, the clinically, it, it is so obvious that you may not do the FNAC, or, um, uh, but uh, uh, sometimes you may do because uh, you do the ultrasound and you will find the cyst there, and then you will do um, uh, you, you can do you can do the workup. Uh, there is no need uh, usually in the thyroglossal cyst and the branchial cyst to prove it, but uh, if there is a suspicion. Then that it is it could be malignancy. Then you can do. Uh, there should be some level of suspicion because FNAC doing FNAC problem is that uh, these cysts are very benign and uh, they are fluctuant and uh, they are uh, they uh, they are compressible and they are easy to take out. The moment you do the FNACs, uh, they become little infected or there is some hemorrhage and um, uh, it messes up uh, the sort of uh, uh, cyst which is which was very you know inert so uh, uh, it is not always necessary that uh, you do the FNAC so it's quite confusing sometimes when we easily suspect lipoma yes uh, lipoma and the branchial cysts are uh, uh, difficult to sometimes but lipoma is is something which slips under your finger so uh, that slipping part because it is it is not that non firm it is firm to an extent that it will slip uh, whereas the branchial cyst will not slip so lipoma is usually uh, diagnosed with that slipping thing but um, yes so you can do the ultrasound and uh, be sure that it's a lipoma or it's a cyst uh, so the ult ultrasound will give you some diagnosis and um, or uh, you can do the CT and find out if it's a lipoma or the cyst. So, yeah, I think that is all that I have on the chat box. What do you, Dr. Neelima? Right. If there are no more questions, then I think uh, thank you very much and um, wish you all good luck.